Thank you. Thank you. So we've now heard about um, communities of kelp and communities of birds, and then we now move to communities of humans. Um, so uh, my name is Ragnel. I uh, will be talking about tourism uh, and how the tourism industry in Svalbard is adapting to a kind of double challenge of, of both climate change affecting the way that they can do tourism and the seasons, uh, but also regulatory changes as uh, the authorities try to deal with also managing those changes. Um, I am not doing this work alone. I have a fantastic team with me from the from Norlands Fosking and uh, the Western Norway Research Institute, so the Northern Research Institute and the Western Norway Research Institute. So we, um, some of them are also in this room. So uh, during the questions, I'm sure they can also contribute afterwards. Um, our case study is uh, located in East Fjorden, so one of the communities where we're also looking, where my colleague has been looking at Kitty Wakes. Um, we have mainly been in Longyearbyen, but we've also had uh, Barnsville, which is um, located slightly further up the fjord. Um, combined, the two uh, settlements have a population of about, of about 2,500 people, and um, also the, uh, the, the population in Longyearbyen has changed a lot in recent years, as the mining industry is declining, it's a plan to decline to close to coal mining, and tourism industry is increasing in, in importance. Um, I'll quickly also say a bit about recent trends in Arctic tourism in general. There is an, an increasing, there is an increase in Arctic tourism as, respon as a response to demand, and also by shrinking sea ice, making it possible to go um, to go to new places. Uh, a lot of this is also these small expedition vessels. So often we think of major cruise ships, but the smaller expedition vessels can take up to 500 people max. Some of them are much smaller. They may be like 20 or 50 people. So you have boats that are much smaller that can go uh, into other places than these like really large cruise ships that have like 3,000 people on them. Um, so what we see is that tourism then is one of the greatest drivers of change in Arctic communities. And in Longyearbyen, um, in 2018, so before the <coughs> pandemic, there was 50,000 visitors on cruise ships. Uh, so there is a major increase in that, and the market is bouncing back after the pandemic, but it's still not back to the same numbers with the with the major cruise ships. Um, in Svalbard, we've seen, I mean, historically, as I said, the mining community has been like the the main source, the main stay of the economy. Uh, there was a small number of tourists in on cruise ships in Svalbard already in the 1900s, but it's really only in the 1990s and onwards that it's become a major part of the economy. And it's also part of the Norwegian government's long-term plan to secure settlement in Svalbard. Um, tourism activities today include hiking, dog sledding, snowmobiles, longer and shorter boat trips, wildlife, cultural activities, skiing, and more. And with the decreasing ice, there is more opportunities for boat-based activities and then therefore also fjord-based activities. Um, so we see that there's a, there's a kind of major growing trend here. Um, and that is also related to the decrease of sea ice. As you can see, the, the passenger vessels are the, uh, the yellow ones, and they, they kind of now are going all the way, this is from 2017, they're, they're all the way up around north in Svalbard. It's much further north than they, they used to be. Um, so these are like the four main drivers of change in, in Svalbard and in Longyearbyen at the moment. So it's climate change, it's regulatory changes, there's also a transition in Longyearbyen from a coal mining community to a more diversified economy where <coughs> tourism is one of the main states. There is also potential for geopolitical tension, as we all know with the situation in the world at the moment, but as well, but it's still relatively calm. So it's not the two main drivers that I'll be talking about are climate change and then the regulatory changes. Um, so that these are but these two others are also obviously affecting the local community and, and all of the Svalbard tourism industry. Um, seen some graphs already. Here's another one: uh, the temperature change and the precipitation, so the amount of rain that comes in snow. Um, that it's a very clear trend, and it's also very. No, it shows very clearly how it, the temperature has increased, and how also the amount of rain has increased. But also that this will increase even further in future, and it's particularly in winter that the warmer temperatures actually lead to more more rain rather than snow. Uh, so this is also a challenge for adaptation and for knowing which places are safe, there's an increase in avalanche, etc. 
Um, so for the tourism actors, there, there's the, as I mentioned, the frequent, more frequent avalanche risks, also in places where there's never been avalanches before. So obviously that's, that's the challenge of knowing where it's safe to travel, where it's safe to take tourists, etc. Um, there's more polar bears in East Fjorden, which is um, where Longyearbyen is located. So there's more polar bears close to where people live. Um, and also that's, yes, that's also a safety challenge for the local community. There's warmer winters and later onset of winters. So when planning the season and planning which trips they will take the tourists on, when there's no guarantee of snow, you kind of have to push the start of the season further back, making it shorter. So that's also a challenge for, for a lot of the tourism actors. And the summer season lasts much longer, all the way up to September. Um, but then again, there is the opportunities for both tourism and ice-free fjords. So some parts, so it's, it's kind of affecting different parts of the tourism industry in different ways. Um, and then none of these changes are really threatening industry viability as a whole, because they're able to adapt in some ways. Um, and the pandemic and the regulation change is really what they see from, from the interviews we've had and the workshops and from, from engaging with the tourism actors that it's really the regulation change that is the major issue for them. Um, also we saw that the pandemic was kind of a welcome break in some ways because a lot of the this major increase was almost too much in the years just before the pandemic and then the, the pandemic was, the, the growth before that hadn't really been sustainable so it was kind of welcome break but now it's like figuring out how what is a good level to to have because they want to have tourism uh, at, a, at a level that sustains the tourism industry but not at a level that kind of slides becomes too much both for the local population and for for the tourism operators but we've seen also that there was limited innovation as a response to the pandemic there was there was some but not not really a lot um, so moving on to these regulations, um, there, as a response to some of these, both the increase in, in tourism pre-pandemic and as a response to, to changing climates and trying to, um, trying to deal with that, um, there has been some proposed new legislation and uh, both for environment and for tourism activities that could reshape Svalbard as a tourism destination. Uh, one is the introduction of a mandatory guide certification scheme that will also be Svalbard specific and not just um, not just a general one because Svalbard poses particular challenges with polar bears and other other things being far away from health and infrastructure and all these things. Um, also reducing the cruise expedition vessel size from 500 to 200 people to limit, because at the moment there's no real limits as to, I mean there's, there are limits obviously, but there's no kind of organized limitation of landing sites. So, there's, because there's around 75 today, but they want to decrease that to only 90 and kind of concentrate the, the places that the tourists go and therefore also limit the places where, um, where there will be kind of human impact on, on nature in these particular places. Uh, and then also prohibit crossing a number of frozen fjords with snowmobile islands, which would then, I mean, this is something that's already happened on a kind of season to season basis. They've closed some fjords for snowmobile trafficking, but that this, this would make it permanent rather than temporary. Um, so for the, from the tourism operator side, there's been a massive lobbying campaign against this from the expedition cruise industry and from Visit Svalbard trying to to influence and to, to soften some of these rules so they will be it will be possible for their member organizations to continue more or less in the same way as they are today. Um, amongst our informants there's been mixed opinions pretty much depending on what kind of tourism operators. So the, the land based ones that, like dog sledding or the ones that take people out on hiking trips, they're not as much affected by these changes, but it's mainly the particularly the boat industries that will be affected by these changes. But it's it, it, it's like some of them are very concerned, some of them are a little bit indifferent or feel like it's it's good that these regulations are coming into place and some of them think it's, yeah, it's a good thing. So it's uh, there's some mixed opinions, as one would expect. Um, but these, um, we don't really yet know that some of these, reg these regulations were meant to be implemented on the 1st of January next year. 
but they now have been postponed a full year so that there'll be more time to revise them and to have more public participation beyond the, the processes that have already involved local populations in different ways. So the government has kind of stepped back a bit to ensure that there is more space for ensure, for for including and for kind of give, also giving time before these changes that will be quite major for some of the tourism operators to give them more ch time to adapt to them before they enter into effect. Um, for the local population, with the, tour, with the cruise ships, there was a lot of people who were not very happy when there's 3,000 people that descend on Longyearby and then walk around uh, the community with about 2,000 people. There was a lot of people that didn't really like that. And so there's this, again, there's this like balance where some tourism, local, local see it as a good thing because it's, uh, it's, it also means that there's more flights, there's open shops, there's, there's restaurants, that, I mean, Longyearbyen has quite a good selection of restaurants for a place of 2,000 people. So it's, it's, like, it's like these trade-offs that they were too much is too much, but some is, uh, is something that they've learned to live with. Um, in our work package and in our, like in our, in our study of the tourism in Svalbard, we've looked at something that we call adaptive capacity, which is really just their ability to, to navigate change and to, to adapt and to find ways of going through that change. Um, so we've seen that what, what is kind of, there's a lot of the people in Svalbard who are, who are highly motivated to stay because they're, you know, they move there, so they're kind of lifestyle entrepreneurs in some ways, and they have a lot of local connection and knowledge, and most of them had a good financial standing before the pandemic. So the, this gives them um, a lot of the locally based tourism operators have survived through the pandemic because they have they have a lot of ability to adapt and they have that kind of buffer to be able to do that. Um, the vulnerability of it is a high turnover of personnel, often seasonal workers that only, that then couldn't come for a season and might have found other work or the, the unsecure, in, like the, this, during the pandemic it was difficult obviously to bring people to Svalbard and so those kinds of, of things are a challenge and also um, that we've seen that those that survived the <coughs> pandemic are uh, have done have kind of done well this year, uh, and it also in 2021, which was a slightly lower season, but this year it's kind of bouncing back. Um, but still, uh, the pandemic is not really a rehearsal for a sustainability transition, because the pandemic was a was an event that happened very rapidly and without warning. Whereas the sustainability transitions and these like new regulatory changes are happening more gradually, so it's a totally different kind of challenge. So. The one isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily say anything about the other. Um, so finishing up soon, I'm just going to take you through a little uh, bit of what we found so far, because we're now two years into the project, and uh, it also builds on research that uh, people in the research team have done it in Svalbard for for a very long time. But uh, what we found in in this project is that so some of these like Things to come into conflict and the regulatory ch proposed changes is that the, the authorities don't really like the system as done, don't really want people to go after polar bears, but citing wildlife is, is important for the tourism experience, but it's not really the main content of a tourism product. Uh, and that uh, the tourism actors perceive the land based tourism as having minimal impact on on uh, wildlife because they follow guidelines and they have quite strict guidelines of what they do and what they don't do um, and uh, they see that you know that there is all these some of them are afraid of all the ships that have been and that that has been too much uh, others see that the wildlife in Svalbard has actually become more rich in the last 20 years uh, and that whales in particular in East Fuel and it's much more common now than it was in the past. And that's again like kind of another tourism product where you can go out on a boat and then you'll see a whale and a lot of people are very happy about that. Um, so they're kind of adapting to the changes by both observing them and by them kind of taking the opportunities that are there but adapting also to the to the challenges. Uh, for the environmental authorities, they see the boat traffic is not compatible with preserving wilderness uh, even if it's not harming wildlife. So it's uh, because if there's a lot of traffic, then it doesn't have this wilderness like appearance. It's, you know, like lots of boats in a queue into a fjord. It's it's a different experience than if you're only one boat. 
um, and also that some of the tourism actors have kind of taken people too close to the wildlife and therefore uh, kind of jeopardized that and also the reputation of the of the tourism industry that's, as one that follows guidelines. So whenever these kinds of things happen, if it makes news, there's a lot of, there's basically a connected, like the serious tourism actors will say that this is not how we work as an industry. So that's a very, there's overall a very kind of um, strong sense of operating in a responsible manner and also trying to adapt to, to climate change and to the sustainability transitions that are coming. So, I think I'll end there, and then if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Nani. And we have time for a few questions, so please take the opportunity. Anyone? Yes, so first there, and then you try. Thanks for the talk. I was wondering if there's like Svalbard or for that matter also Greenland when you were talking about Greenland before. How do you manage to get a representative group of people to interview for an anthropogenic research quest? If people have such different expectations into the development of a country comparing like a newly developing town where people want like growth economy to traditional fishing villages where people want to maintain a different way of life. Yeah, thank you. I think maybe that's more of a question, Philippe, because I mean, Svalbard is a different community, a very different context from uh, from Greenland. Svalbard's population is uh, is uh, is kind of by 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 design temporary. Let's say you can't be born in Svalbard, you can't die there. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, that doesn't mean that, well, you can die there. <laughs> You can't like being an elderly home. Like you have to like to, to be able to live in Svalbard. You have to be able to support yourself as a uh, and your subsistence. So if you have special needs or if, uh, all of that, you have to go to the mainland. Um, so Svalbard is a, is a kind of very particular community. It has been based around the, mi the mining, and now it's kind of transitioning to a more diverse thing with more families and with more well, well, families before, of course, the different different like constellations of of the community. Um, and, uh, and also, obviously, research being a major, uh, major part of the Svalbard population. Um, whereas in in Greenland, there are indigenous populations that have a, a you know a stretches back centuries, and thousands of years, and that's a totally different uh, setting. So maybe Liv, if you want to say something about that, um, but yeah. you can also take it in the day because I see that we are closing to... Oh yes, we can, we can take that in the debate, but say, so, so in face it, we... <coughs> Westlandsbosking and the Nordlandsbosking also have a, another research project called Balancing Act where we collaborate with uh, two of the tourism organizations as um, as partners in, in that research project. And so they have, that, that's like a good way of you know, establishing the number of people to interview, let's say, because they, they've helped, helped us also with, with that. We're, we're interviewing other people from that too, but it's, uh, that's like one of, the, one of the ways we've had a good sample of tourism operators to, to talk to. Um, if that kind of answers the question as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so yeah. nice to give Kai the last uh, oh, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid it's probably a very, very broad one and maybe also something to, to be also dealt with in the, in the discussion later on. Um, when you prepare for a trip to Svalbard, you sometimes come across the statement, Svalbard is the, the best managed wilderness in the world, or will be the best managed wilderness in the world. So is that a fair statement from your point of view, or what does it take, or is it just promotion? <laughs> I am I'm not sure if I can answer that question. It's not in a in a kind of there's no objective answer to that question, mm. is there? Um, but I mean there are very clear set rules of what you can and cannot do in Svalbard. Um, whether that counts as the best managed. But I, I, I can pass that question to Gerta or to Hanko maybe. <laughs> uh, to pick up on in the debate, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lamar.